watching Pioneer Now. On tonight's program, we're joined by AFL great, Norm Smith medalist and triple premiership player, Sean Hart, as he shares his journey as a Christian in the AFL, as well as the challenges of identity and mental health in sport and life after the AFL. You're watching Pioneer Now. Hello and welcome to Pioneer Now. It is great to have you with us tonight on YouTube and Facebook. I'm here with Josh. Josh, how are you? I'm doing great, Keith. Good to be here. Absolutely. For our last episode of Pioneer Now, yeah. for this season, our inaugural season of Pioneer Now is coming to an end tonight. But we are only going to be taking a short break because we've got bigger and better things ahead for season two, Josh. Indeed, we, we certainly do. We've got some big names ahead. Can't tease them just yet. No. But there, there are some good shows on the way. There absolutely are. So we're going to get stuck into it. We've got a great final episode for this season one of Pioneer Now tonight, and we're joined by a pretty special guest, Josh. We certainly are. We're joined by an AFL great, Sean Hart. He's a triple premiership player for the Brisbane Lions. We hear his story. It's really, really great. I'm looking forward to that, Keith. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Amazing man, amazing mm. journey, and has really modelled going out as a believer into the world and bringing the kingdom. I, I can't wait for you to see that discussion. Mm. So looking forward to that one. But Josh, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about a, a pretty big news story. Well, I guess the biggest news story that you and I can certainly recall, which Absolutely. is COVID-19 and, and the implications of that. And you've got something pretty pretty interesting that you want to share tonight. Absolutely, yeah. This is very specific to the church as well. And uh, it's uh, an article called the Ezekiel Declaration. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is an open letter that's been penned by a group of three Australian Baptist church ministers. And this open letter has been penned to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. Um, it's entitled the Ezekiel Declaration. This letter outlines opposition to the vaccine passport and its implementation as proposed by the federal government. The declaration outlines five key points. Number one, the creation of an unequal two-tiered society. Number two, the burden of mental health would be exacerbated with a two-tier lockdown. Number three, a decision of conscience shouldn't be coerced by the government. Number four, the concerns about long-term effectiveness of vaccines in preventing transmission. Uh, number five, that entry into churches shouldn't be based, uh, shouldn't be made based on medical choices. The letter encourages church leaders and members to sign in order to put pressure on the government in regards to their policy decisions. However, not everyone in the Australian church agrees with the declaration, with a number of leaders, including Murray Campbell, David Old and Rob Buckingham, criticising the letter and questioning the premise of some of the key points and their accuracy. As a broadcast, though, the declaration has received the signatures of 2,800 Australian pastors and 23,000 church attenders. And I was just contemplating, Keith, with a number of church leaders that have signed, considering each one represents about 60 or so parishioners across Australia, um, they'd be representing somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 people. It's a lot of people, a lot of, lot, of, lot of voices on this. There is a lot of people. And it's kind of, it's sort of a micro picture of society at the moment, mm. overall, isn't it? Those that are, uh, are against it, which are, you can find many of those, and those equally who, who are for it, there is strong feeling on either side Absolutely. of the fence. And I guess the point here that we want to highlight is not what to do, you know, what position to take, whether you sign it or not, or whatever your view is on this situation. But it's really about, I suppose, being informed and then acting out of a position of faith, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So um, obviously being informed is such an important thing. And I guess some of these pastors who criticise this have said, look, some of these points that have been made are actually on faulty premises, mm. you, know, they're, they're, you know, particularly around transmission. You know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not going to comment on any of that. But the most important thing in this is to be informed, not just about this, and, you know, I'd encourage everyone to have a look at this, but also on many other points as well to get informed. But I guess um, overall the most important thing in this season, especially when looking at things like the Ezekiel Declaration, is to use eyes of faith. Yeah. Um, to not just go, okay, I've made an opinion, my opinion must be right, you know, and I'm going to go with it. No, actually put the eyes of God into these really difficult conversations and these difficult research sessions that we're going to be having over the next few months. You know, it's a critical time for this country mm. and, and people across the world. But, um, you know, when you, when you filter through things through the eyes of faith, you're, you're bringing God's perspective into a situation, yeah. not just your own. And I think that's going to be critical as we navigate this, you know, very, very divisive issue. Absolutely. That's a great point, Josh. And, you know, it, it's important that we respect our, our fellow believers, our neighbours. In a way, where you can love our neighbour is to respect their mm. their conscience, their mm. decision. And we all need to 
um, advocate for the liberty of conscience, don't we? The liberty of individual uh, expression, whatever that is, and to accept other people's viewpoint. Because within the church, we're already seeing that there's a split mm. amongst people. People are going to be for this. People are going to be against it. But as long as we're being very intentional about taking our position for ourselves, for our family members and loved ones to God, soaking that in scripture and getting all the facts that we can and not getting caught up in the in i guess the the anger of the day mm. but but taking a stance of faith as you said that is the best way to approach it because god needs a church ultimately that is is respectful and unified in that regard so i think you're right it's important that we engage in in faith really intentionally whatever our position is and to invite holy spirit to speak to us because this as you said is not going away anytime soon, is it? No, certainly not. So yeah, we need to be wise and mm. that's why we've got God, isn't it? We can seek God and have him speak into this yeah. situation, which is gonna be really important as we progress. Absolutely. Well, coming up right now on Pioneer Now, we're joined by an incredible man. His name is Sean Hart. He's an AFL great. He played for the Brisbane Lions. In fact, in 2001, he was the Norm Smith medalist and he's a born and again Christian. He gave an amazing speech when he received that medal. Before we um, see our interview with Sean, let's take a look at that incredible speech to a crowd at the MCG. Well, that's, that's, oh, that's, I don't know what to say. Everyone who knows me as a Christian, the first person I want to thank is my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. After that, I want to thank my wonderful teammates, the Brisbane Lions Footy Club and all involved, and my beautiful wife, Linda, and my two boys, Jesse and Ricky, sitting at home. Thanks, guys. So some incredibly bold words there from Sean Hart. We talk to him right now about his faith, about his involvement in sport, in coaching, mental health. It's an incredible conversation. Let's watch. Well, we're here with Sean Hart on Pioneer Now. Sean, it's great to have you with us today. Well, I appreciate being part of what you're doing, Keith. It's exciting, and I hope... Uh, part of my own story can impact other people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get stuck into it. And as you know, Sean, you've got a, an amazing story. You've had an amazing um, professional career and an amazing faith journey with Jesus. And we like to start by asking our guests about how they, how they found Jesus. And I believe you became a Christian in 1992 at the age of 21. Can you tell us a bit about that experience and the encounter with God that you had? Yeah, no, no doubt. The uh, the experience that I had started, funny enough, with what I'd call an identity crisis. And two years into my AFL career, uh, the the thing that I'd pinned my whole identity on, my whole purpose, my whole being on, basically being a rich and famous footballer, uh, seemed to be fading away. And the reality came to me that you know what, actually, it's going to fade away at some stage. Um, and funny enough, it's faded away twenty years almost nowadays. So, uh, but the reality to me was that. Everything that I put my whole self into and whole purpose into uh, was was on the line, and I didn't know whether I'd get a contract past two years, to be honest. And so I was deeply searching for greater meaning and purpose to who I was. And fortunately, at the time, I uh, found a lady who has been my wife now for 27 years, Linda, and uh, she had the love of Jesus uh, in her life and uh, and a relationship which is Jesus Christ that I realised I didn't. I, I went along to church with her one day and, and had a uh, listen to a European lion tamer by the name of Kay Shragi give his testimony and uh, talk about the love of God. Uh, the identity crisis I had was that, that all of my identity was caught up in performance, becoming some, doing something. And, uh, and uh, what God spoke to me that day and revealed to me that day was that he just loved me for who I was. And, you know, regardless of what I did and how well I did it, uh, I, I was loved by him deeply. And, uh, and that's been the revelation for me since that day I chose to follow Jesus because he set me free from a performance-based identity. He set me free from trying to find my identity in the wrong places and trying to um, prove that I'm good enough and all those sorts of things that we battle with set me free from fear Again, fear still comes at times, but he's, he's enabled me to have faith to overcome fear and to understand how to do that. And, uh, you know, I realistically, the experience for me became about accepting Jesus and the confirmation, his spirit to my spirit, that that um, I'd been set free from 
um, an identity and, and a wrong purpose and a wrong focus, a wrong perspective on what my life was about. And, uh, and he'd revealed to me his love and his purpose for my life. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful. And it's, it's so true. It's an identity crisis, isn't it? And when we, when we have the revelation that Jesus loves us for who we are, it's just, it's life changing. So that's, mm. that's amazing. And you talked about, um, how your, your life was in football and you had a, an amazingly long career. You debuted, I believe, in round one for the Brisbane Bears in 1990 and your last game was in 2004 in the preliminary final. And you were a, a believer for a long period of that time. Can you talk about you know, what is it like being a Christian in a competitive professional environment such as an AFL club and or what are some of the challenges that you face? I think the uh, overall description I've got uh, for any um, person who's involved in at least elite, uh, sorry, elite sport is that it's an incredible roller coaster. It's no different, really. You know, people in life they know the roller coaster of life, but it is a physical, psychological, and uh, spiritual um, roller coaster. To be honest, uh, week to week, month to month, year to year, uh, and and it's bound up in all of that performance environment and that expectation and uh, judgment, competition, comparison, all of those things are just constantly there, uh, and you constantly learn to live with them. And the fatigue of the of the physical push, all that sort of stuff, is uh, phenomenal. The 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 reality of having faith in that environment is it does free you from a lot of that stuff and help you actually get the right perspective and and keep you uh, in in a way uh, well and truly separated from the things that you could get caught in if you if you don't have faith. Having said that, I I the challenges are about the the judgment and the and the the self worth and all of those things that come with performance uh, and um, and the and the way that people can be treated transactionally instead of, you know, instead of loved, uh, they can be treated and valued based on what they do and how well they do it. And so, you know, it's an environment where um, having faith is, is, has been incredibly important for me and was incredibly important for me. And, and the, the challenges become, you know, very much about living out your faith within an environment that isn't necessarily conducive to it and yet when you get the right perspective towards the environment and towards who you are, the right identity towards who you are, then you can walk into that environment there and actually know that you're coming to bring a new spirit. You're coming to bring change and you're coming to actually love people for who they are. Do, do the work of God and, and love like God does for the, the people who are there and, and live a life that demonstrates a character that's so much different to trying to build a life on performance character and, and on, you know, comparison and com competition only, but actually bringing joy, um, bringing a spirit of joy into a place and, and bringing encouragement into people who desperately need encouragement, who are down on form, those sort of things. So it's a, uh, there are challenges, but there are also, if you get your, your perspective and your face right, there are actually opportunities as well. Yeah, that's awesome, Sean. And that's like um, a big part of uh, our heart behind the program is to empower people to go out into their workplace where there's a different spirit and we yes. bring the spirit of Jesus into that to, to transform the environment. So yes. that's really powerful. And on that, how are you able to incorporate your faith and your calling in that environment? How did you outwork that in your sporting career and your professional life? You know, I think um, for me, the reality is that we're, we're called into all the world, you know, uh, I think it's Mark 16, 15, says that um, going to all the world, we're called into all the world uh, to, to, to minister and to love people the way God has loved us and to, to be the blessing that, that God is to us, to, to the world and to make disciples. And, and we're, so we're called into all the world. And so for me, the reality is, again, that some people might believe that, hang on, as a Christian, you're maybe not supposed to be an elite sport in that sort of environment because it's not a Christian environment. Well, we're bringing Christ into the whole world. Uh, because because the whole world, you know, the hope, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory for the whole world. And so the reality is that, um, you know, we're, we're called into that. And so I realised as well when I came to faith that I'm called called into this. Yes, it's still a battle physically for me in, 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 in sorry, in all three dimensions of who I am, um, you know, day to day. But within that, um, being able to lift your eyes and focus on, uh, focus on the bigger picture and the people around you, and 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 bringing bringing a character and a and a spirit into an environment that 
needs transformation, um, bringing Jesus into that that environment where transformation can happen is is you know it's it's actually a great privilege. It's actually a great opportunity. And and for me, I feel like uh, I incorporated my faith through living out my faith as well as I could. I think you know sometimes we we need to speak and and preach and share share the word, and sometimes we we live it even more powerfully just by what we do. Uh, the decisions we make, you know, e.g., we win premierships. Uh, do you just become one of the ones who gets drunk, rolling drunk sort of thing, or you just you just bring joy? You have a glass glass or two of wine, and you know, you, get, you just enjoy the relationship part of the victory more more than the, uh, the, the over over consumption of alcohol. Again, it's not a judgment thing, but it's just showing people that the joy doesn't come from substances; it comes from um, experiences and relationship and, and and deep relationship and you know and even just incorporating my faith through sharing at times with with young players and encouraging young players and the impact that can have on someone who's battling just to believe that they belong is just is is substantial. There's there's many many examples and opportunities that I've had uh, within my sporting career to do that. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. And on that, you, you mentioned the premierships with Brisbane. And in 2001, you played in Brisbane's first premiership and you played a, a significant role in that finals campaign and on the actual grand final day. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the week leading up to the game? Like, What's the build-up like and how did you prepare for that? Oh, the week leading up to the game, I love talking about this because it is uh, – uh, it's an incredible, you know, surreal experience the whole week, realistically. It is. Uh, 12 years into my career, I finally made uh, a team that was making the grand final. Some guys will never get there. Now, some guys rarely play finals, but uh, we were all of a sudden a team under Lee Matthews on the verge of that. And we won that week up at the Gabba against Richmond. Uh, my The team I barracked for as a boy actually knocked them out and we, you know, we thumped them at the Gabba and, and all of a sudden we're part of a... Uh, you know, grand final week, hoping to win a premiership the week later. And and I'm on the way home, driving my vehicle back to the Gold Coast from the Gabba, and uh, the most incredible sense of fear came over me. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, you know, because we have faith, it doesn't mean that our thoughts and fears and um, anxieties and all sorts of stuff, pressure is, you know, disappears. It just, it's not the case, but it's about how we then deal with that. And so, through my journey uh, and the things, the roller coaster ride that I've been through, and the understanding of the, the importance of faith, I knew right there and then as, as a wave of fear of failure personally in the grand final and as a team, um, just almost knocked me over as I was driving. To be honest, it was such a wave of fear, and I can't describe it. Spiritual attack it was. I I decided I had to build my whole week on a particular scripture, and I did that on Philippians four thirteen, which. In, in some version says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And uh, there's even a version in the message that talks about, um, you know, I can do all things in the one who makes me who I am. Again, a, a statement of identity, a statement of identity beyond performance, a statement of identity that I can do all things. I can actually face the pressure, face the fear, and understand that no matter what happens, uh, God will still be, God is for me. He's not against me. Uh, and he's with me at all times, sort of thing. So that 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 just helped me build a week. I, I meditate on that scripture. I, I say to people, I would sit on the toilet and I'd have on the back of the toilet door, and uh, and I would meditate on that scripture and and ensure that that became such a real truth that God was speaking to me and He was going to be with me. I've never felt this is an absolute truth. I've never felt as, as peaceful and as ready to play a game as I did when I ran out in front of 100,000 people that, that week on the MCG. Exhilarating, um, frantic, pressure, uh, but ultimately, you know, um, was able to survive that pressure because of putting faith in to combat the fear. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. And it's when fear comes, meditating on the scripture, isn't it, it, it is really the key to activate the peace yep. of God. That's really powerful. And of course, famously, you won the Norm Smith medal that day for the, the best player on the ground. Can you talk about uh, the experience of winning that and why you chose to honour God in that moment? Yeah, well, the game was just so frantic, so full of pressure. So you know, it's just incredible. You know, you get in there and people ask you about, you know, what, what do you remember and stuff in the game? And you just really don't. It's, it's just goes so quickly. There's just constant 
trying to stay in the moment, even though you're thinking about the scoreboard and all sorts of stuff. But but to be honest, you know, coming from that identity crisis that I did have you know, two years into my AFL career and coming to faith, I and coming to uh, an understanding of the love of God and the identity that, that God had created me for um, beyond performance, that then freed me to become the the team player and the contributor and the you know all the, all that God has enabled me to become uh, to get to that day to to be composed and to be able to execute and to go through all that have been built up in the twelve years and yeah you know, well not twelve years but ten years since coming to faith leading up to that all of the the, the disappointments all of the exhilarations but to, to survive that pressure and then to then to hear that I was nominated as the Norm Smith medals. It, to be honest, you know, you, you understand when when God transforms your heart and transforms your life. Well, you, you just you just have to tell people about it because it's the it's the uh, it's the incredible uh, blessing that you just got to pass on. And and so for me, He set me up on a platform that day and gave me an opportunity to speak to probably four or five million people across the world. And you know, that's the reality of the the AFL Grand Final and, and the spread it goes to. Uh, funny little story after that, I got enough mail in the next two weeks before I went back to the, the club that it took me a whole day to open open the mail that I got from people around the world, literally. So, uh, but but yeah, it was just testimony and a thankful thankful heart to Jesus that he he needed to be recognised for the impact he'd had on helping me stand on that dais. Mm, awesome, awesome. Well, we're with Sean Hart on Pioneer now. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back soon. Today, we want to introduce you to the Hope City Mission online learning portal. Hope City Mission provides emergency food relief to those in financial hardship, and our mission is to bring hope to our clients and to help them step out of the cycle of poverty and step into financial freedom. Many clients find themselves in a poor financial situation, and they often have very limited financial literacy skills, which is why we developed the Hope City Mission online learning portal. This service empowers, educates, and equips our clients through a wide range of online classes, aimed at training them in a variety of financial and life skills. The online learning portal is laid out in an easy to follow format. Clients can select from one of many short courses. These courses include how to budget, preparing resumes, how to use banking services, understanding superannuation, applying for rental or utility assistance, setting goals, as well as many more. Each module contains video tutorials, written material and practical tests in order to build our clients' financial skills. As a result of the online learning portal, we have seen our clients start to take greater ownership of their financial futures. With 65% saying their financial knowledge has increased and 35% saying their financial knowledge has substantially increased. Whether you are looking to gain knowledge or to use this program to work off fine debt, the resources, tools and knowledge are now available at the Hope City Mission online learning portal. For further information, go to hopecitymission.com today. Well, we're back with Sean Hart on Pioneer now. Sean, it's been great to have you with us. And we'd like to know about some of the challenges that you've faced during your professional career. You know, you've opened up in the past about your battle with depression at stages during your AFL career. Could you, could you talk to us a little bit about that period and what you did to overcome it? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, again, as I said, uh, this Christian life doesn't promise that we'll be free of any, anything, to be honest. And, uh, and I think I spoke uh, previously about the, the building towards that Norm Smith medal and the, the, the power of faith, overcoming fear. And part of the lesson of learning that along the journey was in 1994, I experienced a, uh, a mental health challenge. There's no doubt about it. It was, it was off the back of really probably pushing really hard, feeling burnt out, not, not almost um, finishing the success cycle, I like to say, which sort of is about enthusiasm, hard work, and then ultimately it should result in some levels of success and it just wasn't happening. And and I um, I found myself in such a state that I had to tuck myself away in bed for six weeks, literally. And, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't that long, but um, I was literally in a dark state for six, six weeks, wanting to uh, totally get away from footy, not, not wanting to necessarily from my memory, you know, take my life or anything like that. But I, I had to get away from footy and, um, and that, you know, it was, 
I was in a, I was in a state physically, mentally, spiritually that was just really dark. And uh, uh, the how it worked out was that I, I actually had two people that knew about it: my wife Linda and uh, and my footy club chaplain Dean Davis. This was 1994, so again, it was a couple of years into my career. The first significant test of, of my faith and and I, I honestly say that it taught me so much because I didn't operate in faith at the time I I uh, but but I fortunately walked out from it because I had some connections who had their trust in God I, where I didn't put my trust in God at the time and and I tried to wrestle it and fight it and actually probably flee it to be honest flee the challenge flee the, the pressure I I had Two people alongside me that, as I said, Linda and Dean Davis, footy club chaplain, who, who through their faith and through their trust in God said, no, we're just going to keep you on track here. These are the things we need you to do. And Dean Davis even said to me, all I need you to do, mate, is, is treat your footy like work at the moment and just go to train. Just just go to train. That's all I want you to do. It was, it was I'm telling you, Keith, that was incredibly difficult in itself just to get out of bed and do that. Uh, and then to be able to go and play on the weekend in a local comp because I wasn't clearly – anywhere near the form or readiness to play, I would be exhausted after five minutes playing in the local comp, absolutely exhausted. And I was the you know, one of the best athletes in the footy club. Such was the uh, the ravage that this um, battle was doing on, on my being. But but again, it was coming back into faith and trusting in God that uh, brought me through. And, and God brings us through. God God raises us up. You know, we can, even, we can give ourselves credit, but he's the one that brings us through. He's the one that gives us the purpose beyond the pain. That's what happens. But there's something really significant that I, I want to speak to people in in the battle that I've been in and the battle that they might have been in or are in or may go through. And that is, there's a couple of things. One I've already mentioned is it's so important to have people who truly trust God and get alongside them. If you are battling, get alongside them and let them speak into you the truth and the love that God has for you and, and journey with them. Don't isolate, be with those people. The second thing I talk about is that our footy club uh, psychologist, Phil Jauncey, a Christian guy, he told me once recently, and it wasn't at the time of this, but it, it really spoke to me again. I spoke about Dean Davis saying, get out and go to training. But Phil Jauncey has dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of his patients as a psychologist. And, and where they've had a battle here, he would say to them, what are you doing about it? When he said that to me, I thought to myself, wow, that is not something I'd even sense to say to someone who was in a mental health battle. But it is essential that we get up and we do something about it and that we don't tuck ourselves away in bed. We don't tuck ourselves away from the world. We don't hide. We don't isolate. It is essential. That's what the enemy of our soul wants us to do. It's essential that we get up and we do something about it. And that can be done by just responding to a great connection, someone who, who we trust who says, right, let's get moving because we're going to walk out of this thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's really powerful. H- having the right people, um, as you said, you're trusting God who can encourage us and lead us out of that darkness is, is, is so vital, isn't it? That's super, super important. And Sean, your career ended in 2004, probably not the way you would have liked with, with an injury in the preliminary final. And um, and what was the transition like for you out, out of the AFL? And how did, how did God show you the next step for you? I think he was showing me in the last few years of my career, to be honest, I, uh, it was still difficult. Again, it's this identity piece. You're 15 years, you're someone with an identity in sport, and that's where the world the world looks upon you that way and values you that way. It's funny. And, yeah, not the people close to you, but most of the other people just want to talk about this football. They're like, tell me about your footy, and it's the last thing I want to talk about. But I, I think the last few years of my career, God was preparing my passion for coaching, for doing what had been – you know, giving, sorry, not doing, but giving what had been given to me, to be honest, and passing that on and, and coaching um, people and helping them understand. Initially, it was about about footy, but this is what I've come to understand about this this coaching dynamic. It's, it's such a special dynamic. It's such an incredible leadership dynamic because coaching has two key elements to it, and, and they are that you need to be great at asking questions, open-ended questions, so asking great open-ended questions. And the second part is to be a deep listener. That's what I've discovered, that God's helped me understand. They are the two key things to great coaching. Why, why am I saying that? It's because he led me down a passion and a path to move towards that uh, because that, that, I believe, is part of the secret to, being, to going into all the world. 
is if we want to be people who can bring Christ into environments, we need to be people who are great askers of questions, deep, you know, open-ended questions, I should say, and people who have an ability to deeply listen, not talk too much, but deeply listen, because that's where we hear the heart of people. That's where we actually get to know where people are at in their own journey of life and, and faith and, and whether or not they believe or don't believe, we actually can connect with them deeply and then speak into their life depending on where they're at. And that's, oh, I just find the coaching dynamic, which seems like, you know, when you're involved in it, it's a performance dynamic. It's, it's if you get the people thing first right, then, then all of a sudden, um, and you capture their hearts, all of a sudden you can speak deeply into their life and then you bring the character of Christ who lives in you, and all of a sudden you've got a recipe for taking Jesus into all the world. And so that that has now led me uh, today to be part of an entity called ID Sports, which is which is all about shifting a narrative, flipping a narrative from what we call performance-based identity to identity-based performance. So in other words, I'm using my own testimony because that's what God's given me about where our identity truly comes from. And from the identity, we can build performance instead of trying to focus on performance and build an identity of becoming a performer, build the foundation first of all. So we, we want to flip the narrative um, and we believe that coaching can transform, transform sorry, can be transformational into the sporting landscape and, landscape and in fact, into, into all of the Australian landscape where people are building a performance-based identity or, or an identity on the wrong things um, and need to be set free from that so that they can become the the performers who are called to do certain things and gifted to do certain things and can do those things as uh, excellently uh, because they are solid in who they are before they do anything. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that. It's like um, God works from the inside out, doesn't he? And that's, he that's really laying the foundation for that. That's fantastic. And just, just in closing, I wanted to ask you about your work in schools with kids combining um, your sports program with the message of Jesus and equipping them with life skills. You know, I remember you came to my school in, I think, 2005 and when I was in year nine and it had a big impact on me. I remember you speaking in our gymnasium to, to, the, to the kids there. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, about, about your, um, your program with schools and why you think it's so important. Yeah, which school was that? A Donvale Christian College. Wow, wow. Well, yeah. I did mainly, most of my work was done in Queensland and I would do it yeah. on the day uh, leading into training in the afternoon. That was uh, back in the day, of course, because it's now a full-time occupation sort of thing. But I uh, went into schools mainly with a program called Cool Choices and we wanted to talk to kids about what are the best best choices to make in life uh, and and help young people understand that it is it is better to give than to receive. Ultimately, it's better to be someone who uh, wants to, you know, be a blessing to others more than just think about what I get out of this life. It's a, um, you know, ultimately we want young people to definitely find faith in Jesus Christ through the radio station um, 96.5 in Brisbane that we were working back into and, and as Hamilton, who I was with on Sunday for Father's Day, actually, who's leading a, a church up at, up at Redlands in the Gulf, uh, sorry, in Queensland. Uh, and and so our, our message was about um, the best choices uh, are always choices that, um, that really that bless other people that um, you know, that uh, give ourselves to um, you know, to to love other people and uh, and and they're not selfish choices. Um, and so through uh, what we did, uh, there was there's multitudes of other messages we would share. But but our, our desire was to uh, was to make sure that young people started to think differently in a world where so much is in, invading their their body, soul, and spirit about. You, you need to get this to feel this type of thing, if you know what I mean, and you need to look like this or be this type of thing. And uh, and, and ultimately, I, I used to say to young people that I used to ask them the question, why do you think um, we go to training uh, as footballers? And they say, you know, oh, I've probably to practice your skills and to get a bit better and to, you know, and to, and to work on tactics and da da da, da that sort of thing. And I said, oh, I've... I've thought to myself that there's something bigger than than that. And I said this, the, the, the reason we ultimately go at the elite level, um, not ultimately, but a big reason we go at the, the elite level is because we want to be able to know the best choices to make when we are under pressure. 
and to execute those choices when we're under pressure. And so the message in that was that there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in your life, young people, where you might be feeling like there's a choice you want to make to fit into a group order because it feels good, but is it the right choice? Is it a cool choice to make in the long, in the long term of your life? Um, and being able to help young people get to that point, e.g., someone's about to offer you drugs at some stage in your life, what, what are you going to say? Are you prepared for that choice? Are you prepared to go, you know what, get out of my way, I'm never touching that stuff? Or are you just going to not be prepared and regret the choice you made because you weren't prepared? So that's what I, you know, one of the messages I like to share uh, when I when I used to do the program Cool Choices and uh, and I as a as a coach and with our three D coaching and you know, ID Sports with our three D coaching, we want to transform the the hearts and the minds of, of athletes and coaches so that the environments they create are transformational, not transactional, not about performance, not about your value and your self-worth and your identity being in how well you perform, but that's so much greater than uh, that beyond beyond the sporting field into the all-of-life situations for people. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, Sean, I'd wonder if you could pray for our our church members tonight as we close. If you could pray yeah, for people who might be struggling in their mental health and for people who are struggling in their identity and to empower them in their calling and their assignment for Jesus. Yeah, I'd love, love to do that, Keith. That would be great. God, I thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for Jesus. And, God, I thank you for what you're doing uh, in our nation and in the lives of people who, uh, who are opening their hearts to you today, God. I, uh, I know the, the, the battle that mental health can, can produce in people, Lord, and I declare that, that you are the answer to all things. You're the answer to this battle, Lord. You're the answer, and I, I uh, pray for anyone who right now is going through any type of challenge in, uh, in their mental health. I know that it's actually also deeply rooted in the third dimension, in, in their identity and their purpose. And I pray that they would, um, that your spirit would confirm to them, Lord, that your love for them, uh, that you'd fill them with, with peace and strength and joy and that you'd set them free. God, that you'd set their mind, you'd set their spirit, you'd set their whole being free from this, the battle that they're currently going through. Lord, I ask that you'd help them to get up and to move and to uh, and and to answer that question, what are you doing about it? To get moving and to put their trust into you, Lord. And I pray that they get set free right now. And we did testimonies of freedom for the people who are listening today, who are going through those battles. Mighty God, I thank you. And I pray for all people who are listening, Lord, that that they would hear that message. That um, it is so much better to have an identity-based performance, Lord. In fact, it's 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 what you desired. It's what you spoke over. Now, Jesus, Heavenly Father, it's what you spoke over your son before he began his ministry almost. You said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Mighty God, let, let people know that that's what you say about them and that that's who they are before they do anything uh, and help them then to know their calling, Lord, to, to know that their identity is in you and their purpose is in you and help them become uh, so amazing at the influencing people for your glory in whatever it is you're calling them to in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, Sean, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for giving us your, your insight and telling us about your faith journey. And we hope to see you again soon. Go on, you, Keith. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you to Sean Hart for joining us there. And uh, what a great guy. What an amazing story. I love how he's talking about going from that performance-based identity where he's tied up everything in his performance as an AFL football, uh, football player and then transitioned into receiving that Jesus-based mm. identity and then how he's encouraging other players to, to take that on board for themselves. It's really powerful. Absolutely. And it's the model uh, um, for the kingdom, isn't it, mm. for the Seven Mountain Mandate. It's a big reason behind this show is that we take the kingdom and it always comes from within us and it's supposed to work out to our environment and he's a perfect example of a believer full of faith right in his identity with Jesus and he's taking that model into an environment that works the opposite way. I just find that so so um, exciting that there are men and women in those sporting arenas mm. that are doing that and that's how we transform society. It was awesome to hear. Absolutely, yeah. and he was so bold about it. I just mm. love how down to earth he is. He's just, you know, 
on one hand, he's just another football player, but on the other hand, he's got this really powerful calling in him and he's absolutely. executing it just absolutely brilliantly. Mm. So thank you so much to Sean Hart for joining us tonight. Well, today is the last episode of Pioneer Now for this season, Keith. It's been an incredible uh, season. We've had some amazing conversations, haven't we? It has. It's been it's been incredible, Josh, to be um, to be online in this format, talking to, to strong men and women of faith, hearing about their journey and hearing about their ministry insights, as well as I loved hearing about people's insight into what God has been saying to them mm. in this season. There's been some um, awesome revelation out of that, really informative, and um, we've enjoyed everyone being online, joining us uh, as we've been going through important news stories, highlighting the areas that the church needs to be aware of, as well as speaking to, to mighty generals of the faith. And we're going to be back soon, bigger and better than ever. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. So yeah, we're going to be back with Pioneer now a little bit later in the year. But until then, we hope you enjoyed the program and the season. And we'll see you next time on Pioneer Now. Take care.